Welcome to Ripple Effect, a podcast from Formstack revealing how simple decisions can have a lasting effect on others. I'm your host, Chris Byers. Today, we're doing something a bit different than what you may have heard in previous episodes. 2020 has been a year many of us did not anticipate from the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic to the injustice and inequality that we're seeing more clearly here in the U.S., And we want to do our part in sharing voices and perspectives to our community and how we can think about being more proactive and and take action to really just improve the world around us. At Formstack, we've come to our own realization that not only do we need to say something, but we also need to do something. And so we started with our own statement that Black Lives Matter and really affirmed that we want to be a support to the Black community today. In addition to that, we've hired a diversity talent specialist to help make our organization more welcoming to diverse candidates, as well as helping us bring in a more diverse candidate pool. We're finding ways for our employees to give their time and money to help fight social injustices and inequality. And then we're starting conversations. And if you hear anything today, I think the most important thing you should hear is about conversations and and really education. What we all need to do right now is think about having conversations with people around us about race, racism, uh, et cetera. And so in this episode, we have Ade Alano on the show. He is Formstack's founder, and he is here to have a conversation with us about a personal story he shared. And it's all about sharing his story on racism and how we can improve diversity and inclusion in our own workplaces. So take a listen. Today, we have a really cool opportunity to to get to talk to somebody who has been really important in the history of our company and and the history, really, in in my life. And, you know, he's going to help us explore a topic today that I think is is really top of mind for a lot of us and and trying to figure out how do we best approach going forward. And and that topic actually covers a lot of things. It's about the, the racism, the the challenges of the Black community and and ways that we need to uh, help overcome those challenges. It's about uh, equality. And, you know, who I've got today uh, with us is our founder, Ade Alano. And Ade has founded really a number of companies, one of them uh, being Formstack. And and we've gotten the benefit of being able to uh, be a part of this organization and, and grow together. But maybe more importantly than that, he and I have been friends for 23 years, I think, at this point. And I just think really cool opportunity to, to be together and be able to talk about uh, some of this. And so want to welcome Ade. Thanks, Chris. Excited to be here. Excellent. Well, um, maybe just as a, as, as a quick aside before we get into to more uh, serious things, where was it we met 23 years ago? Do, do you remember? Uh, I think we were both working at the same place. I'm not sure exactly if that's what caused us to, uh, to meet, but where was that? Yeah, I, I don't know if that was really the first time we've met, but the first time I remember is when we were both working in IT at Anderson University, where we're both going to school. Is that what you, you remember? That That's what I'm remembering. So uh, yeah, kind of a, a cool, I mean, I, I think, yeah, who, who knows exactly where we met along the way, but I, I know we got to uh, work together in IT off and on over, over a couple of years. And then that eventually led to uh, founding a company together. And then uh, Ade founded Formstack later on and, and kind of worked out well, but he founded yet another company. And so at the time I said, hey, if, if I can come help be a part of finding the future for Formstack, I can do that. And, and that turned into just kind of a long-term role. But what, what's really interesting about Ade and I have t- talked about everything uh, over the course of all these years, and especially in the past 10 years, we've talked about family and business, and we've had endless meals together and endless meals with our families. And, and yet, you know, what's fascinating and sad is one of the conversations we never talked about until three weeks ago was race and the the impact of that on Ade, the impact of that around us and in the world. And right now, I think we're just really, it's an important time where we need to be having these conversations. And the fact that we haven't been having them has created an unnecessary just kind of layer of just not talking about the right things in, in our in our country. And so, Ade, you wrote an article uh, and it was titled, I Can't Breathe. And you share your kind of personal experiences with racism, prejudice and justice. And kind of in the opening, you mentioned struggling on whether you should write it or not. 
Can you talk a little bit about what made you write it? What, what helped you decide to maybe finally uh, kind of put that together? So I wrote that about a week after kind of the, the news that about George Floyd came up. And like I, I start out in the piece, I really struggled for a number of different reasons. One, one of which is that I felt like as I was thinking about and, and kind of the whole country was talking about George Floyd, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, you know, I felt like I was a little bit uncomfortable talking about my own struggles because they pale, you know, <laughs> compared to those stories. I mean, clearly, um, I'm still here living and breathing. I, I haven't had, you know, incidents where I've been really like attacked by police or, or, you know, anything, you know, to that extent. And so really struggled with how do I talk about my struggles being black in America in the context of those stories, which are just much more tragic. So I, I think that was part of it. But then in general, I, I struggle with kind of what you alluded to. I think growing up in the, in the nineties here, it was almost, um, there's kind of this unsaid thing, like you don't, you know, we shouldn't talk about race. And I've always struggled, you know, as somebody who's trying to succeed professionally. And I, you know, I don't, there's, um, I think a lot of black people in the workplace kind of struggle with if you talk about race, then you're kind of going to be pigeonholed into this viewpoint where, you know, you're somebody who always brings up this issue and it makes it uncomfortable for others. And so almost like, I have unfortunately swung too far to the other side where I don't talk about that enough publicly. And so kind of struggle with what's the right way to approach that and, and how do I tell the story in a way that like, people would listen. And like finally um, just got to the point where I felt like I had to write something. And that article was kind of the outpouring of kind of my background and, and what was on my mind. Well, and you know, I, I do just fully agree there, there's some message and, and I can't even tie back exactly when it happened, what it was, but there was some message along the way that was definitely, if we don't talk about this, then it's not an issue anymore. And I've kind of thought about the, the stupidity of that, I guess, in the past couple of weeks where, you know, if, if we had, if, if you had some sort of uh, maybe disagreement with somebody, or if you had an issue that was not helping your relationship with someone kind of succeed. And if you ever said to your friend, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to talk about it. The response would be like, that's stupid. Like that is totally not going to be the way you ever actually communicate with somebody. You're just going to, you know, bury these thoughts and ideas. And, and if you never talk about them, then you've, you've like lost an opportunity in your relationship. And I think it's just fascinating how this conversation I mean, between you and I, even even about this article was just extremely eye opening for me to say, oh, actually, and, and it's also OK to have this conversation and it's OK to say we do have different backgrounds and that does mean something and it has impacted the way that we've lived or grown up. And so uh, I just you'll get to see a link to this article if you're listening. Um, we'll post that in kind of show notes or, or otherwise here in a bit. But uh Definitely worth a read to kind of get some more color here, but we'll, we'll talk through this a little bit more. So, you know, in the article, you, I mean, first of all, just extremely eye-opening, moving, and 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 beautifully moving in a way where I saw so many people who I know care about you share it with other people, and it was great for them to be able to say, you know what, I I now see something I, I might not have otherwise. But how, as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, as a tech founder, how these experiences shaped your kind of professional journey? I talk in the piece, and, and I won't rehash the whole thing, um, but, but essentially I talk about how eye-opening kind of my, my journey growing up here in the U.S. is different because I'm Black and how that gets reinforced in all these small ways you know, throughout my career and just as I'm growing up. And yeah, I guess in terms of my professional journey, I mean, I'll say I, I talk in the piece about how one of the things that I allude to in the piece, that one of the things that's really hard is that you know that racism exists in the country, like, you know, it's, it's, it's empirical, but you don't always know the ways that it impacts you. There were jobs that I thought I was qualified to get, but I didn't get, you know, an interview or didn't, didn't get a, you know, didn't get a job offer. and Maybe none of them were because of racism or implicit bias, but 
maybe some of them were statistically, I would have to assume so. Similar in terms of raising capital, uh, like there as an entrepreneur, there are times where many, many times that I heard no from investors, which is common for entrepreneurs, whether you know you're white, black, brown, male, female. But sometimes you kind of walk away from those experiences wondering, like, is it was it because of the color of my skin, or is it just because they didn't like my idea or, or something? You know, didn't really click in the pitch. And so when you think about to your question about how to shape my professional journey, I I don't have any like stark stories of nobody ever kind of kicked me out of their their offices saying I'm not going to invest in you or I'm not going to hire you because you're black. But it's something that was top of mind as I kind of walked through my journey at every, every single point. And so that I think that affected uh, the end result was I always felt like I had to work a little bit harder, and I always felt like both in terms of output, but just in terms of my own psychology as well, to kind of put my head down and like ignore the reaction from the outside world and carve my own path. And so I don't know, that's a very nuanced answer, but um, in terms of how it affected me, but I guess, yeah, I'll just in summary say it's something you think about you know, all the time, uh, but you never really know what opportunities you lost because of the color of your skin. Well, yeah. And I think it's, if I think about my own life and, and how I've never gone left an interview, left a, you know, a capital raising opportunity, left a, a conversation and thought because of the color of my skin, it mattered. I just, it, it's not even a thought that comes to my mind. And so I can completely understand how that it is. I mean, it's, it's a weight you carry. You're trying to raise money and that's already hard enough work. And if there's just one more thing that causes your own doubt or causes you to just wonder, it works against you and, and makes it just all the more difficult to get done the job you're just trying to get done like everybody else and is, is, uh, is challenging. I'll just say real quick. I mean, one way to think about it too is, you know, walking into a VC pitch and, you know, if you walk into a boardroom and, and all the all the investors you're pitching to are white men and, and they tell you no and you look at their portfolio website and it's predominantly white founders, again, men. And, and I think the stats are that only about 1% of, you know, venture investments are to you know, black founders. Um, and I forget, I forget the number uh, of women that, that are invested, but it's, you know, again, single digit percentages. You know, you have to think, okay, there's a pattern here that the industry has shown. And then similarly, if you, you know, if you're applying to work at a company and you look at their website and it's predominantly white men, um, you have to wonder, like, do I really fit in here? And, and, you know, despite their best intentions, am I, am I starting a few steps behind, um, kind of, you know, other entrepreneurs or other candidates, you know, when you see kind of the results of, of who they're, who they're investing in and who they're hiring. Well, and I think it's fascinating. You're talking about technology where we think of ourselves as the most progressive, the most, you know, ahead of the time in terms of whether it's anything from benefits or, or hiring more diversely or being open to new ideas. And yet, even in technology, uh, you still have those questions. I'm, I'm curious, how, how do you think this does impact the technology scene, industry, and, and what have you noticed that of how it applies still to technology, even though we think of ourselves as forward thinking. It's really interesting to look at because, yeah, as you said, I'm sure if you pull the people who work at technology and compare them to you know other industries that, that we think of as less progressive, it is true that personally we probably have more progressive mindsets than other industries. But the interesting thing about technology is the systemic racial problems really are compounded when it comes to technology because usually you know access to a computer science education is something that's afforded to the the wealthy people in this country or or you know the people with access to great schools and and good backgrounds and even something as it may be even something as specific as you know the people who are more likely to be good at coding are more likely to have laptops in the home or access to a computer at home I don't remember all the details um, about this, but I remember reading something relatively recently talking about how at the kind of before the explosion of the PCs uh, kind of in the 80s, 
male female participation in computer science was about equal. But then what happened was that um, this article is speculating that with the rise of PCs in the home and PCs especially focused around gaming and the types of games that were on the early PCs, what happened is inevitably boys would kind of push out the girls from using the PCs because they were the ones playing the, you know, the games and the action games. And then, you know, over time that compounded to mean that there are fewer and fewer women that were, you know, in the computing field and, and like felt comfortable taking computer science classes and stuff like that. And so anyway, so, so back to my, my whole point being that I think those types of effects compound if you have fewer black people able to, you know, succeed in school. Um, especially around like t- computer fields and maybe that's because of access to computing at home or, you know, access to great schools that are providing that. Then that shows up kind of later within tech. Similarly, when thinking about entrepreneurship, one of the big problems with venture and investing is that, um, venture capital funds are typically looking for, you know, a lot of traction with the companies that they invest in. But, you know, in the very early days, it may be that Black entrepreneurs have much less access to kind of that, those friends and family rounds that they need to kind of get an idea off the ground before they even get that traction that, that can get to the VCs. It may be that even just kind of the lack of a safety net where they feel like uh, if they tried something risky and failed, that they'd be able to brush themselves off and either get, you know, get a loan from friends and family or get a job um, to kind of replenish their bank account uh, and maybe they don't have those safety net that their white counterparts do. So that compounds as well to why I think we see the problem so much more starkly in tech versus, you know, versus other industries that may be less risky. You know, I, I think the technology is really interesting here too, because in technology, we're always thinking about solving problems really quickly and we want to, I mean, yeah, it's, we're, we're always thinking, oh, we're five minutes away, we're weeks away, we're a couple of years away from solving major problems at, at speed. And yet what you're talking about is there are so many things that we've got to go so far back um, or, or wait a ways into the future to really make serious impact. We need to start an education and finding more fundamental ways to provide education on entrepreneurship or finding, to your point, access to capital or, or helping uh, helping people even see there's an ecosystem that maybe they can join or be a part of to, to help new ideas. I'm curious if you've, um, you, you are an investor, you've thought about these things. I'm curious if you've ideated on your own ways to ha- how we could think about having some more long-term impact. Yeah, you're, you're right in saying that, I mean, it's a very complicated issue that isn't going, to, there are no overnight you know, successes here or no silver bullets to kind of solve the problem. So, yeah, I think it, I think it spans all those things you touch on. I think it's, you know, it's education at an early age, it's access. It's, it's even just things like people seeing themselves represented. So, I mean, just even the archetype we have of this, you know, successful entrepreneur, we look at people like Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates or, you know, Jeff Bezos you know, all white men and not going to take anything from their accomplishments or, you know, incredible entrepreneurs. But some of it, I think, is just even just socializing more the the successes, people of color and, and women who, who are successful um, and kind of changing the, the way we have a conversation about what what an entrepreneur even is. Yeah. So I, I think it's a systemic things, but I, I also don't want to. I think it's in some ways it can also be a cop out to kind of say, well, it's a pipeline problem or that, that these issues are too complex. And I think sometimes it really just, it, it does just come down to trying to make a difference by being conscious of your own biases and working on that personally and really working on, I think for every investor really working on their network and make sure that they are talking to founders of color, or they're talking to female founders just as much, you know, as they are talking to white male founders, um, or at least, you know, in proportion to the population, right? And so and so maybe working a little bit harder to make sure that like you're in the right networks to see that kind of deal flow and conscious of your own biases and working through that um, when talking to people. Because I, yes, the, the systemic issues are definitely there, but I think we can all improve you know, in the moment in terms of how we approach our business. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I think you make a great point. I, I hope that we all walk away from this conversation hearing there are things to do. Absolutely. Now, I think one of the things, as uh, I will say, as a white person, I have come to realize is, first of all, just in general, how much racism still exists and how much, in a way, I support those things and, and have supported systems that create this longer term kind of systemic racism. And I don't tend to think about my past a lot. I don't think about where I came from. And, and yet I don't see, therefore, how many bits of access I guess I've had over time, whether it's capital or otherwise. I can think about, you know, one of the things I've learned in the past three weeks is just how difficult or impossible to get a mortgage uh, as a Black person in the 1950s. And, you know, I think about, I was trying to pay off some debt. My, my wife and I were trying to pay off some debt early in our marriage. And one of the th things that allowed us to pay off that final bit of debt was an inheritance I got from my grandparents, who I know got a mortgage in the 1950s. And part of that inheritance was from them selling their house. And so these are things that most days I would never think of as like, oh, that's an advantage I have, um, and yet have completely played into some of the ways that I've been able to, uh, to move forward. I wonder, as we do think about things that we can do now. You, you've brought up some of them. I know as, as a company, there's really a couple of messages that I've been trying to just begin to talk about. One is I want to make sure we have a, a space for conversations. Um, as you and I both know, as we all know, social media is a horrendous place to have a conversation. Um, it's all about headlines and, and you know my dramatic view on the world. But I think one of the challenges is we're not talking about these things and we're not able to say, hey, can we sit down and, and have a, a, a peer level one to one conversation about your views, my views? How, how can we learn together and grow together? I'm curious if you've seen some good examples of conversations beginning in the past, uh, really in the past month. So, you know, one of those things that we're talking about is, is having conversations as, and as a company, we're trying to begin to facilitate that so we can have maybe a third party come in and help us uh, just have some better real conversations together about race, racism, equality, and, and how we as a people can make sure we are treating the people around us on a peer level and, and, and truly as equal and making sure they feel comfortable uh, being around us. Um, the other thing that we're talking about is really diversity at, at a greater level. So we have had a very broad, very broad <laughs> diversity uh, kind of plan in the past. We've, we've talked about it internally, but we've not made a big deal of it, frankly. And, and in fact, I've, I've also taken a very inbound approach to it, I guess, where I said, yes, everyone is welcome here. I, I hope this feels like a comfortable place. But one of the things I'm realizing uh, really just recently is that's not enough we need to be much more proactive at saying both, what are the things that we do in our hiring practices, in our onboarding, even in our marketing? How do, how do, we, how do we show up and how do we look to people who might not look as much like us? And how do we make sure that feels less like the case? And so, you know, I think one of my questions is, what do you think some things technology companies can do to improve diversity, inclusion, and really making a better effort here? Yeah, I think you're thinking about things the right way, I guess, to start. I mean, and, and just to underscore the point, I think being proactive about it is the right approach. And I think that's what's encouraging about the conversation that a lot of people are having right now is that realizing that it's not enough to just not be racist, but you actually have to be anti-racist. And especially when recognizing that there's systemic racism in this country, you have to be proactive to counteract that. And, and and so, yeah, like you said, it's not, it's not just enough to say, oh yeah, we, we, we welcome everybody. You actually have to seek out and maybe work a little bit harder to make sure that people from under, underrepresented groups know that they're welcome there and that you're reaching out to like hire and recruit people. I, I think, as you know, the, the longer you go as a company and the less representation you have in your company, like the harder it is. Like nobody wants to be or very few people want to be the only black person to work in the company or the only woman to work in a company, right? And that just gets magnified. So in terms of, to your question, what can tech companies do about it? I, I think, you know, understanding that, prioritizing it in a way that maybe hasn't been prioritized before. And I think, you know, in this moment, we all have to ask ourselves, yes, we care about these issues, but, you know, how much do we care about it? Do we care about it enough to, to really make it one of the key corporate initiatives and put money and time behind it. 
and that may mean you know hiring people um, within the company to really kind of spearhead these initiatives. To that to that point, I think one of the most important things anything within business you need to you need to measure what's happening within the company and have accountability behind those numbers. And I think when I think about, I, I'm certainly no expert around HR and, and may may not have all the tricks in my in my tool belt in terms of how to solve you know diversity and inclusion within companies. But I know like foundationally, as you have to start with understanding well and measuring you know measure your pipeline, measure you know the, throughout the interview process, measure and understand you know retention around all the dimensions of race and gender and um, sexual identity and understand like where are we falling short and and where is there room for improvement and so just creating that mechanism and that infrastructure i think to, to measure and hold accountable is one of the, the first places to start to make sure that like something meaningfully changes and it's not just a nice sounding initiative uh, but that there's actually kind of teeth behind it towards making change yeah, you know, and, and I think for us, we we hired uh, a diversity talent acquisition specialist early this year, and I will say, frankly, we probably wouldn't have done much reporting, uh, maybe in in terms of the leadership team or something, but not publicly. Again, out of a, a naivety of like this is going to just work itself out over time. And one of the things we said last week to the team is, you're going to start to see a monthly report on this. And I know as an organization, we've always thought transparency is a huge key to creating good accountable systems and showing reporting because if I'm, if I'm showing this to you every month, then I better show some, some progress and, and show that we're doing a better job of finding the right places to uh, both show up and are we learning to how, how that talent funnel is working out or are we letting people drop out that shouldn't drop out? And so I, I like, that, uh, like that thinking. Is there anything else that comes to mind that you just think companies should be doing to both improve diversity, making sure it's a, a more comfortable, engaging place for for diverse team members? I think that, um, as I said, I, th- I think it's important to kind of look at the whole picture. So not just in the hiring process, but what happens to what the company looks like once you've hired somebody who's unrepresented within the company. And so looking at retention, I think, is important and under, and really focusing on that inclusion part of diversity and inclusion. And and so that means, you know, do they feel like, do you feel like their voices are heard? Does it feel like they're safe and, and, and comfortable and, and welcome um, at the company? But some of that also means, like, are they, do they have the same opportunity for growth within the company as as do others, right? And so I think back to measuring, you know, measuring, you know, what retention looks like, measuring what, you know, pay looks like within the company, you know, by across, you know, different diversity dimensions, measuring what, you know, kind of promotion looks like. I think, yeah, focusing on, on that, that, that part of the cycle and that part of the funnel is important too. I mean, just in the same way that you know, as we think as our business and, you know, more success SaaS business, we think about acquisition and retention and, you know, churn and, and kind of all those dimensions when we, when we think and measure how we're doing as a business and think about the customer, I think you need to do that from an employee perspective as well. Kind of look at the whole life cycle and the holistic picture of what it means to work at a company. Yeah, that's, that's good. You know, 2020 has been a tough year, as, as I think everybody knows. And, uh, you know, if, if any of you were to ever be in the room with Ade and I, one of the things you'd notice is, you know, both CEOs, both founders, we wouldn't necessarily, though, be the loudest person in the room. And in fact, you might not even notice we're there at times. And I think you've put yourself out there in a, in a huge way, being extremely vulnerable. What are the things you're doing to kind of just stay mentally healthy and, and both and figure out, like, how do I both respond and, and frankly, grieve at times at what's going on, but then also say, you know what, maybe there's hope in the world and maybe there's something I can do. Yeah. So just, you know, personally, it's, it's been a tough few weeks. And I would say, I mean, I guess to really ex- explain that a little bit more, because I think, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with black friends, I think, who are kind of in the same boat where I remember vividly, you know, the Rodney King incidents, you know, back when, when I, was, I was much younger. And there have been a number of incidents kind of similar to that that have had broad visibility within kind of the public, like from Rodney King. To, to George Floyd. And I think one of the struggles that I've had is, you know, each time 
you know, a story like that flares up, like it brings a lot of emotions. There's anger, there's sadness, but in the end, it leaves a lot of hopelessness and thinking that nothing's changed, right? Like we've known about issues, especially surrounding kind of police brutality and criminal justice, you know, and, and how that's affected people of color disproportionately in this country. Like, We've known about it for a while, but if anything, it's probably gotten worse in the last 20 years when you look at the number of, of black people in prison and, you know, the militarization of police, like those trends have gone in the wrong direction. And so I'll say one of the hardest things, to be honest, when I first heard about George Floyd, I was just kind of coming off a, a few weeks ago, the Maude Aubrey case just really shook me. And when I heard about George Floyd, um, I read the headline and just went on to the next story. And I, I just wasn't in a place emotionally where I wanted to process it. Um, and it took a few days before I was able to watch the video, before I was able to, to read kind of the details of that. And the great thing that's happening now is there's a lot of conversation about all these, these problems and, and injustices. But I think one of the hard things emotionally is to wonder, like, is this really going to change is anything going to come out of this or you know are we just reopening old wounds but not really going to find the healing from that and so you know that's a, this is a very indirect way to answer your question but just kind of give you know i think it's helpful to give context just because i i know um i mean i'm certainly not speaking for all black people in the country but i know for for a lot they're going through a similar emotional journey and it's why it's tough right now it's hard sometimes and, and i think we all need to be mindful that not every person of color really wants to have these conversations at the moment just depending on where they are in their emotional journey but for me uh, i mean i've had to uh, i've done a number of things to kind of help myself stay healthy and sane i mean some of it is just kind of fundamental things that i try to do on a regular basis exercise meditate eat well um, spend time with family but then some of it, I think, is just taking breaks from social media, taking breaks from the news, um, especially when I feel myself get kind of get caught up in in the in the anger and emotion that's that's being you know, spurred by by those mediums. And then I'd say the last thing is really trying to focus and kind of step back and say, well, how can if I do want things to change, like how how can I help contribute to that conversation in a positive way, and what what can I do? And so you know that's practically like for me been been spending a lot more time kind of learning and understanding these issues from kind of a policy perspective and a, a you know sociological perspective where that's not my background I'm a technologist I'm an entrepreneur and so spending time learning more about these things I think kind of helps me understand how to process better well, you know I I think you're you know if you're listening to this and you're everybody's going to be at a, a a broad set of responses to what's going on right now. And I know for me, I have, I'll say had to, and and had to, because I just understood something needed to be done in my own mind, in my own life. But I've had to spend a great deal of time reading and watching videos and watching documentaries. And it's all, and I will say even I had to, watch the video of George Floyd. And it was, it was probably, um, there was a moment where I was like, you know what, if I really want to actually step forward and be a positive part of the change, I need to see some of the lows and be a part of some of the lows, I guess. And that was, I mean, to anybody listening, I'd say, if you've really just done surface level headline reading, if you've really just done surface level, you know, attempt here, if you've frankly, not had a conversation with somebody of color, like around you, those are things you're missing out on. And I don't think you're going to progress in the, in the way that I think we all need to, to, to have the right conversations. And so I, I appreciate that everybody who's taken time to really spend time reading and thinking and trying to understand like, what, what is my perspective and, and how, where does it need to change? And, you know, how do, how do we need to improve uh, to move forward? I know as a company too, we've, we have brought in some outside help to help us, first of all, as a leadership team, but then eventually as an organization to see where, frankly, even where are we on this subject? Because, again, we're all at different places and we need to kind of begin to move toward the same destination. Uh, I know we've used an outside uh, kind of coaching group to help allow our team to kind of call anytime they want for coaching counseling uh, kind of through this. Uh, any particular 
subject matter uh, books, blogs, podcasts, et cetera, that you'd point people to to say this this is a great place to start? Yeah, I, there there have been a, a lot of good ones that I've come across, especially recently. Um, but I, I guess rather than rattle down a list, I'd say to your point, I think it's important for people to to start somewhere that really kind of touches on both the the history of um, systemic racism in this country and then kind of a full comprehensive overview of where we are today in terms of um, the criminal justice system and and probably the best thing that like I've come across and, and you know there may be others but the documentary 13th on Netflix I think does an excellent job of kind of piecing all these things together there are and, and yeah so I, I'd say you know start there and that at least kind of helps launch a starting point to see where you might want to dig deeper to kind of understand different components better. So personally, I'm, I'm reading um, Just Mercy right now and find it really eye opening kind of you know, digging into the kind of the criminal justice system. But yeah, I don't if anything, you know, start with the 13th. It's probably the easiest thing to, to consume. That's good. So, you know, one of the conversations that I've noticed is not ha- it kind of being had in this country is what certain things mean. And I guess I'd love your perspective. And I, I think we should all note that it's it's your perspective. And, and I think you will say it's not everybody's belief exactly. But there are a couple of kind of thoughts, phrases, movements that, that I think uh, might be valuable for the audience to kind of, kind of hear up, like what, what's going on here. And the first one is Black Lives Matter. What Ade, tell us what that means to you and what you think that means to uh, the people who speak it and, and are, are out kind of thinking about it and, and kind of moving it forward. Yeah, certainly. I don't, I don't claim to speak for all black, black people or for any particular organization or, or anything like that. You know, I don't speak for Black Lives Matter. But um, yeah, to me, that, that just means you know, at its surface that, yes, Black Lives Matter. And I think that that's highlighted because... Uh, you know, especially when you kind of look at the history of Black lives in this country, and and again, what's happening today, like the, the incidents again, like George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, you know, uh, Elijah McClain, and, and and so on and so forth, is that it's easy to feel like Black lives don't matter to the system. So all it is is just highlighting the fact that yes, they do, and they should um, in this country, and that's not to say that other other people don't matter. Um, we certainly all do, but that this is one sector of society that has been long ignored. Um, and we need to make sure that um, there's equality and justice for black lives, just as there are for white lives in this country. You know, it, it, thank you for, for sharing that. I think the, the one of the things I, it's been just eye opening for me in, in this, uh, in this time is, if you look at the Hispanic community in the U.S., it is um, on the whole, uh, at, especially at the size that it is and, and how much it represents the U.S. today, not been in the U.S. nearly as long as as kind of the black community. And yet the black community is behind the Hispanic community in terms of income, net worth. And as I looked at that, I thought, wow, that there is there is definitely a problem when um a community who has been with us uh, all uh, like nearly always uh, is is that far behind. There is there is something that speaks to why we need to speak uh, about Black Lives Mattering today, and why we need to point that out and make it a thing and make it make it the point. And so I, I thank you for sharing those those thoughts. Yeah, and, and just to speak on that, you know, r- real quick, I, I think the thing that's easy to forget, and and I, I mean, I think part of even going back to what we said in terms of you know during the '90s and, and the, the last last couple decades, it's almost been that the conversation has shifted in this country to talk about like we live in a post-racial society and feeling like racism was solved during the civil rights era, and, and clearly, I think we're seeing very clearly that, that that's not the case but even even given the progress that was made in the civil rights era it's discounting today like how much of that history does matter and like you said you know you know the, the injustices that happened in this country really weren't that long ago when you think about it in the context of um, how it's affecting people's lives today and maybe that's like the example you gave in terms of 
you know, receiving an inheritance that helped you pay down loans. Well, you know, when black people in this country kind of started with nothing and weren't allowed to accumulate wealth and, you know, weren't allowed to have the freedoms to just basic freedoms within this country and kind of starting so far behind, um, those things still matter. To, you know, those, those things still make a difference today. It's the reason why the average net worth, the median net worth of black households today is a tenth of that of white households. You know, that, yeah, that's still affecting us today. The things that happened, you know, 400 years ago, much less 50 years ago in this country uh, and, and the Jim Crow and, and such. So yeah, it, it does still matter today. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you for that. Um, the, the other thing that I, I think would be great to kind of express what, what you think is happening right now is um, there are protests going on all around the U.S. And in fact, um, if you think they're not happening because they're not hitting the news, uh, it's actually because I think a number of very peaceful protests are going on right now all over the country. And so that's not making the news. But there is a message that is still trying to be kind of delivered at the moment. What, what do you think that is? Yeah, I, I mean, protesters are asking for a bunch of different things, but I think you know, right now the most the, the most critical issue again goes back to just we want changes in in the policing systems in this in this country. We need changes to the criminal justice system, and I think, and again, I don't I don't speak for everybody. Every, you know, there are different perspectives in terms of what people want, but I think we need meaningful change beyond. Just, um, I think what we saw, you know, a few years ago when kind of the start of the Black Lives Matters protests is, you know, largely in action. But then I think there was a lot of kind of talk and superficial things about like, you know, let's add training, like let's, let's increase training within police forces to help them, you know, overcome racial biases. Maybe, uh, let's add body cameras, um, and invest in body cameras to help make sure that, that we're catching things that are happening. And the reality is, as far as I can tell, and I, and I think most people are saying that that didn't do much. And I think one thing real quick, the, the reason why the word systemic racism is so important, that, that term systemic racism, is because it highlights the fact that, you know, we have this system that it's in, in and of itself is disproportionately affecting people of color in this country. The issue is systemic. And so that's everything from for me personally, just really passionate about removing cash bail, our system, the, that the fact that we have people can get arrested and though innocent until proven guilty, just because they can't afford to pay a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars for bail, they're held in the system, which creates all these ripple effects like I, that in itself. I mean, it, it disproportionately affects people of color. And that itself is, is an example of systemic racism. The war on drugs itself is an example of systemic racism. So I think we need to think, rethink fundamentally what are the things that we make illegal in this country and what are the punishments behind them? Why did that happen in the first place? And you can kind of look at the history to understand, like, you know, why was crack cocaine, you know, why was sentencing for crack cocaine 10 times more than sentencing for powdered cocaine, the equivalent amount of powdered cocaine? Why was marijuana made illegal in this country? To begin with, and and those, you know, the answer to those, unfortunately, were racist things, right? And so, I think protesters are asking for a lot of things, but I think they're asking for meaningful wholesale reform to the criminal justice system, so that we're not locking up people of color at disproportionate rates. We're not, you know, we're not killing black people, you know, at disproportionate rates. That these systemic things need to change before we see the results that we want to see. So as, as we take all of this kind of conversation in, as we think about um, kind of where we go from here, what are the things you, you hope people, uh, I don't know, how do we move forward what, what are, so that we actually have that positive ripple effect and can look back days, weeks, months, years from now? What do you think the things are that we can do to, to move forward? Yeah, ultimately, I'm, I'm, I mean, I should start by saying that I'm more optimistic now than I probably ever have been that, that things will change. And, and one of the reasons why is because, you know, people are having conversations like this that are, that are meaningful and, and people do seem to on a wide scale trying to be trying to understand where and why systemic racism exists in this country. So, I mean, in terms of moving forward, I think just one that needs to continue. Like you, you said earlier, 
I think if you haven't had conversations with people come in your life, just, just ask, ask about these issues and ask with an open mind and, and an open heart. I think that will do a lot towards just improving your own understanding and towards getting the change because I mean, I, I think awareness and understanding needs to precede change. And so starting there and then you know, to deepening understanding. And then I think, you know, what will come from that is really understanding, you know, like I touched on a couple things like bail and, and, you know, the drug laws in this country. But I think the change that needs to happen is political. Um, I think, you know, the change that needs to happen is that, you know, we need to, we need to push, the, you know, our politicians to readdress some of these issues and kind of fix some of these issues. And the way that we do that individually is, you know, by voting, um, by encouraging others to vote, um, and then, you know, by calling politicians and, and sending them letters and demanding change. And, and I think it may take some time, but, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's the real answer is that we need, we need to change the system. Well, Dave, thank you for joining us today. I hope that the just everybody who's listening is really thinking about how can I be a part of uh, positive change, be a part of raising my own awareness, starting conversations with people, thinking about uh, the ways that I might have supported racism in the past and do today even, and how can I break that and become uh, anti-racist. And I just I thank you for many things in life, but uh, this is in, in particular today is being just a help to us moving forward and help to opening up your story so that we could learn from it and uh, kind of grow going forward. No, thank you. But great to chat about this and great to talk with you as always. <laughs> and so, um, and I'm glad we're having this conversation. Thanks for joining us today on Ripple Effect. What we heard today was a really powerful story. And it was the powerful story of an, a Black individual who, uh, first of all, has been really important in my life, but I hope his story has become important in your life to really reframing what we think about in terms of racism and how it still persists today in this country. And I hope it causes you to want to take some action. If I can encourage you to take any action, it is really start a conversation or begin researching. Where can you find people or resources to help you take the next step? And how can we move forward this conversation on race and equality in the U.S.? Well, thanks for joining us today on this special episode of Ripple Effect. You can read Ade's full story at A-D-E-O-L-O-N-O-H dot com or follow him on LinkedIn.